Good morning. We are starting the Board of County Commissioners of Rio Blanco, Oak County, Colorado. Are you ready? Sorry, I'm shy. He said he <laughs> okay. June 13th, 2023, work session. It is 8.16. Um, this meeting will be streamed live on the RBC YouTube channel. Work sessions are intended to provide opportunities for the commissioners to study difficult issues, gather and analyze information, clarify problems, or give staff direction. No official decisions will be made. Work sessions are on a floating docket. The schedule is provided for informational purposes only. Sessions will normally be considered in the order in which they appear on this schedule. However, all times are approximate and may begin at the commissioner's discretion. Additionally, the board may alter the schedule, take breaks during the meeting, or continue an item for a future work session date. We are starting with facilities, Eric Hawkes. Um, it's from Administrator's Update Maker Airport Waterline Direction. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I have a lot to talk about today, so I hope um, we're able to capture all that. Um, I want to reserve the last 20 minutes of this for discussing some
some of my team's accomplishments in the last six months to this year, and and some uh, shout outs to some particular individuals that has made some some nice accomplishments for the county and within our team. So um, to get started, I wanted to discuss the airport water line expansion. Just to do a recapture on it, right? We decided that we would budget for 2023 a water line expansion. The primary goal of this water line is to provide adequate fire flow for fire protection at the airport. It's an infrastructure project. Um, we uh, projects of this nature aren't covered under the FAA um, uh, funding and the capital improvement project planning. These are more covered by either the airport sponsor or through grants and other funding sources. So the original schedule, of course, was that we were in a complete design by March, issue out procurement in, uh, in April, have the pipe uh, on the ground ready to go and a contractor ready to begin uh, by June 1 to install the pipe. Uh, that has not occurred. Um, the biggest uh, concern, of course, is that we need to acquire right-of-way uh, easements across two private property owners to the west of the airport before we can begin this project. It was decided that we would halt the design documents at 70% before uh, we, uh, and that we would not proceed forward with the procurement of the materials prior to us basically having these easement, easements can, uh, finalized for the county in the project. Um, we have contacted uh, both the property owners uh, to the <clears throat> west of the airport property. Uh, Don here has been in contact with the property owner uh, Gentry that owns the property directly to the west of us as attorney and they were working they are working currently through the legalities of being able to execute that easement. Yeah, and the problem with that is, is the there's three deceased landowners that are split up, and so we're trying to figure out a way to give us some assurances because they're working on getting the probates and getting getting the thing cleared up, but it's going to take a little time to do it. Eric is wanting to get it done, you know, while the weather's still decent and everything else. So uh, uh, Melody Massey is the one that's uh, uh, the attorney for him. So we're working on some assurances, uh, an agreement by the heirs and or PRs that once they vest in the property that they'll convey the easement to us. There's some risk in that, the way there is, you know, anytime you take less than 100% interest in a, in a property, you can take, take some risk on it, but they'll mitigate our risk uh, quite a bit. We have also, I've also sat down and met with the property owner directly to the west of Mr. Gentry, which is Laura Schultz, and gave them the uh, proposed documents for the easement, which also include a mirror of the proposed uh, agreement that we have presented to Mr. Gentry, which is in, in lieu of us going across their property for this easement, we would provide them a water tap and we would do an installation on the water main for the pit. Uh, that's our proposed. Uh, neither has come back with a, a formal counter to our offers, and neither has executed the full agreement. So with that being said, it is my recommendation, and after reviewing the, um, the water line analysis that was done in November of 2021, that we begin to think of maybe possibly drawing a line in the sand and, and pursuing an alternate uh, supply for this water flow. Now, after reviewing the, I went back through and reviewed it. And so we had um, we had done a review of, of three potential sources of of water for this uh, to for this project, and it was what we were calling the upper tank, which was uh, the subdivision up above the airport, and and that would have been the water line coming across the two properties to the west of us. Uh, the other would be to expand on the water line that's currently supplying the water for the airport, which comes up Highway 13 and runs north. And then also what we were calling the lower water tank, which was coming off of the water supply that supplies the hospital. Um, 
with the water supply that currently supplies the, the airport, we would need a lift station to get to the proper flow and pressure that we need for adequate fire flow. The water supply to the west um, basically was our best option because it provided the best amount of pressure and flow. It's a 12 inch line, it already has a lift station, it would supply more than an adequate amount of pressure and flow for what we need to meet standards for the airport and a fire flow system. The third option, of course, is a hospital. And I had, it, during discussions and, and time, I was thinking that it was definitive that we needed a lift station for that supply coming off the hospital. And after re-reviewing the analysis, it did not require us to have a lift station if we come off the hospital. However, it is a longer run, and it would, uh, and the, we're right on the, the line. It's not as great as the water pressure that it would be to the west, but it, it is in the analysis that, that that is a viable option without a, currently without requiring a lift station being mandatory for that project. So with that being said, I think we need to explore that option uh, given how long it's taken to acquire these easements. Um, I always like to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is kind of where we've done our best. We've tried our hardest to go for, you know, the easiest, the more accessible option. And now it's time for us to, to accept it and, and move on. Um, what I'm proposing to the board is that if we don't have a, a, um, if we don't have easements that are signed or well on their way to being signed by the July 11th board meeting, correct, we are meeting on the July 11th board meeting? Yes. Okay. By the 11th July board meeting, that's a good point where we, we say, okay, we've done our best to make this option uh, feasible for the airport, and now let's let's move on and start heading to and explore other options. Are we good? Seems reasonable. Any questions? Well, that was surprisingly easier than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, so moving on to other business. Uh, so one of the things that took place here in the first part of 2023 was that uh, my department, uh, we brought the Fairfield Center and apartments underneath the, the management of my department for maintenance. Um, we've taken a slightly different approach with uh, MCCIC taking a, a front seat in, in more of a handling of the, the maintenance and, and upkeep of the apartments, and, and I think that's going really well. I met with the board yesterday. Uh, we have a couple of topics out there we'd like to discuss with the board, the number one being the boilers for the uh, apartment D complex. We we uh, we had purchased uh, at the end of 2021. We had purchased a new boiler and water heater for that building, and because we've been experiencing a number of issues with the boiler system, and then you know, like anything, you buy the new replacement, and all of a sudden the system starts working. And so there was a question of whether or not we keep the existing system going as long as possible. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, it's gotten worse and worse with the boiler. Uh, we're at this point of most mornings I have to go over there and reset the boiler to get the hot water and heat going. And then resetting the boiler has gotten tougher and tougher. Um, we've done some work on it of, uh, at the beginning of, yeah, at the end of April, where we replaced an expansion tank and a pop-off valve and, and adjusted a few things on the boiler, thinking that that might resolve the issue, and it hasn't. I think we're at the point where we no longer sink any more money into this existing equipment and we take advantage of the new equipment that's already, already been purchased. I informed the board of this. Um, A1 was the, the plumbing contractor we purchased the equipment through. We felt that that was a good sole source for installing that equipment. They understand the system already. They are to have, to me, today uh, a, a cost estimate for installing uh, 
uh, that new equipment and replacing the existing equipment for those those apartments. As soon as I have that, I will discuss that with Janae. As I understand, the previous uh, commitment and idea was that the county would cover the installation cost of that, and that we had set we set aside some contingency for when this this instance would occur. Any issues with that plan? Questions? The second thing that occurred fairly recently was um, along Main Street uh, at basically the corner of the northeast corner of the Fairfield. We had a pine tree during a storm on Memorial Weekend blow over and lean against the building. Uh, we lucked out the fact that I think that pine tree did a slow gradual layover and so we didn't have any damage to the building. Um, Mr. Overton here gave an excellent hand on getting that tree dropped to the ground and then the facilities guys made quick work of setting that tree up and then of course we had many citizens that love to have firewood at free cost so they the tree was gone before <laughs> I think the birds moved out. <laughs> um, but this, however, did bring up some concerns of the board and CPIC board. Uh, I guess uh, a few years back, or, and I'm not exactly sure when it occurred, there was a tree that was on the west side of the building that fell, and it happened to, uh, it lucked out and it didn't damage any property, but it did, uh, it had to be cut before a resident of that apartment could exit their, their uh, apartment. And so, there has been some current concerns about some of the other trees in, in the complex. Primarily, there's this tree right here that is growing extremely close to one of the apartment complexes. And then there's a, another tree here that sits right between two of the buildings that they have a lot of concern over them falling and harming people. Uh, we discussed it with the board. The board is in favor of us getting prices to have those two trees removed. Their concerns is the resident safety, um, not just in the instance of it falling and where that would potentially harm somebody, but in general, these sheep, these trees also sh uh, shade a lot of the walkways, causing icy pathways and and overall, you know, maintenance issues that we have. And then there's some concern on this one that's growing next to the the building, what type of structural issues that it might be causing with. The systems, the sewer, the water, and, and structurally for the building. Um, they have requested that, you know, in lieu of planting a tree in that area, maybe we do something like a raised planter box and, you know, we do something nice to fill that area in, but that it doesn't cause us maintenance or issues that down the road. Any Thoughts on that? Concerns, objections to to that? Asking to to do it or asking for money or what's the? I think the the better thing is uh, I'm seeing if whether or not you guys have any objections to us removing those trees to the thought process on why we're removing those trees or if maybe. Uh, there is some alternative thinking to to what our our thoughts are on it. Because if not, then then we we feel that with the support of the MCCIC board and also you know my own department's belief that those two we are we concur with their thinking that it'd be nice to remove those trees before those become an issue. But if there's some other thoughts and feelings about it, we would take that into consideration. I think if the MCCIC boards on board with it, and I'm okay with it. I'm, uh, I'm certainly good with your recommendations. I, I, I guess, you know, we're not going to get a lot of, uh, if the MCCI board is okay with it, we're not going to get a lot of public pushback. I think we always okay. expect some with yeah. removal. It is is always very passionate subject. Um, I think, though, uh, in this instance, especially with the the board being in favor of it and being an overall, you know, consideration of safety, um, I think that those those the costs outweigh the benefits of 
with the with the uh, incident of that other tree falling down, I think it's an opportunity that we should take advantage. And he was looking at putting in a raised flower garden there where one tree is going to go, so that should help alleviate some of the impact. All right. Well, we'll we'll proceed forward on getting those executed. Okay. So um, this is moving around a lot faster than what I expected. So uh, oh, we uh, can we like to make your job easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would like to shift gears to our broadband and communications department. Um, you know, at the end of 2022, we. Uh, we proposed to the board that for 2023 plan that we would look at areas that we could start investing in expanding the fiber network. Um, the idea being that we, you know, originally when we did the first deployment, we took it in big chunks and we had a lot of grant funds and those types of things. In this, this approach, this is more systematic, looking at the overall network both wireless and fiber and seeing where we can have the greatest levels of impact um, essentially taking care of the low-hanging fruit uh, we designated that the cross l subdivision which is just west here of meeker is is a really great option where uh, it's it's a good place for us to develop a learning curve because we plan on doing this work all in-house so we would be doing the planning permitting, uh, installation, uh, everything that goes into doing the expansion on fiber, but this would all be done with our current team. Um, but, you know, the cross health subdivision was uh, primed for this being our first project because one, during the development of the cross health subdivision, the cross health subdivision granted all the roadways and utility easements to the county. So that made the legality of doing the installation a lot easier. Um, cross Hill subdivision does not have any paved roadways and a lot of the residents do not have full paved driveways and there's a lot of clear easements into those homes. And so that provided a lot of ease in the planning and hopefully the uh, installation of the lateral and the, uh, the fiber drops for these homes. And then given the fact that the location is it's in the shadow of Lobo, so there has to be a number of repeater secondary towers to be able to provide these residents internet. And so that comes at a, a high operation cost within our department. It's a high labor to keep the radio systems going and, and the expanding the fiber in that area helps us uh, resolve some of those labor intensive uh, elements to managing that system. So that's basically why cross -L became the focus right now. Um, so we, one of the parts that we were missing is we did not have a good application tool for planning, maintaining, and documenting what our fiber network is. So we had these a hodgepodge of spreadsheets that said, okay, this is where we installed it. This is the, this is the system. So you know, with the fiber and our typical backbone and laterals, we install duct systems that will be made up of a number of interducts, right? And that goes to handholds, which are basically concrete boxes in the ground and they can range from size depending on, you know, how many, how much of the backbone and how much of the lateral fiber comes into that. And then from there, those fiber web out. And then within those, those conduits is the fiber and those fibers can have multiple, uh, you know, individual fibers in that line Somewhere is, you know, can range from, you know, a single fiber strand to up to, you know, we have some lines that have 420 fiber strands. And so you need to keep track of it. And then within those fibers, there's colors and splicing and that type of stuff. So we elected to go with the vitro fiber map as the tool to do it. Um, we had a lot of information that needed to be put into the system to get it a usable system for us to do planning. Uh, we've completed phase one of installing our laterals, backbones, and known main uh, fiber pathways. So you can see here on the screen, we have um, 
basically the two communities now installed in the system. And as you go in, um, you start to see what our fiber network looks like. And where this tool is so usable is when you look at an area like this, right, it gives you the information of that fiber run. It tells you total length, and eventually, which is phase two, it will tell you what the fiber allocation is in that. So when you look at the strand of fiber, it'll tell you where the green fiber strand goes to, what residents, what that drop is. And so that, that would be phase two of entering that information. But you can see that we've gotten, we have all of the current uh, backbone of our fiber system, our lateral, and then we are completing the drops to the houses. So essentially phase one's done of putting the information in, and now phase two is more of the detailed drops in fiber share. So how uh, exact do you make that drop to the house? Do you map it exactly where the drop is, or are you just going to say it's going to this house? So at the handhold, we have GPS locations for that handhold. On the drop, we're, we're going off as close as we can to the side of the house. You know, um, for example, um, I'll use my, my own house for, for an example, which is right here. My fiber comes off of this handhold here. So when we get ready and we do phase two where we're installing the drop, I know that the drop comes back down this line. It comes down through the middle of, of my dry apron in the back, and it comes in towards the uh, west south corner of the house. And, and we know that from a combination of our documents, from a combination of our knowledge of the system, and so we will try to get it as close as possible um, to where it comes into each address. Location. A lot of work. It is, and that's. Uh, but you know, it's it's one of those one of those things. Once we get past that monster curve, then it's going to be information that's in here, and you know that's where it takes the next step. Where now we know, and and we know how precise that is, and, and we can move forward. Now, of course, the other side of this tool is planning. Now, in the past, what we did was we contracted that planning out. An engineering firm would go and take our information, and they would take aerials much the same as this, and they would use a tool much similar to this, and they would plan out the next expansion, and then they would say, here it is, and we would use that to contract it out. Well, now we have this tool. We're able to do that in-house, and so this is the current plan for uh, cross sales subdivision. And you can see this isn't just drawn on lines. This is where we intend to bring those locations into each one of those houses. Now, one of the things that this tool allows us, but we haven't been able to optimize yet, is we can do overlays of other utilities. So we're working on uh, importing in cross uh electric services, their phone system, and and then also their domestic water and their irrigation systems. Uh, right now we have the plot that has this, and so we're going back and forth and, and looking. Of course, we did a, a field survey and a walk with the, the team, and we went through and we took a look at it. Now, the other thing that this, of course, does is this helps us track expenses to see where and how much it costs us to do something like this expansion. And so it is our intention to, now we have it laid out, we then import what material costs are going to be, and then we're going to track labor and equipment costs during the installation of this, and this will start to give us that historic information we need when we look at what other future expansions we should be planning for. How many drops are in that? 21 drops. Do you know how many are on that? Uh, obviously, that will take 21 off of the load of the uh, wireless. 
Um, I think, I don't think it's quite all 100% is on the wireless. So it'll probably take right now an estimate 18 off of off the wireless. How many is on the wireless? I think 18 is on the wireless. No, I mean the home station for the wireless. How many houses does it? Oh, does the tower cover? Yeah, the tower. Um, I don't have that right now. Um, I know it covers the that one tower covers Cross L and Buckskin, and then that's a repeater for the water tower that then also covers Strawberry. Like 55 or 60 on that new system, and then in Cross L, I think there's like two or three on Lobo, so that'll take quite a bit off of the new system. And then So this is that progress report on on systems like this. This is you know one of the usable tools, um, and then of course the information from the man behind the curtain um, on, <laughs> on the count. Um, you know this is our progress towards being able to do this in house. Uh, this is a this is a the solution. This is probably one of many for us to continue to improve. Our network to improve customer service to improve how we operate and also our knowledge base in, in in the department and so I feel like we're we're showing good progress on marching towards that plan that was proposed back in August of 22 um, and I'm having this makes me feel a lot better right on, on knowing where the system is and then once we get that next phase of knowing where the house drops are where the fiber count is then when we have issues where we have to go out and do repairs, we know that one, we go out there and we know that it's as close to the truth as possible. And then if we make alterations to the system, we have a good tool to capture those so that the next time we do it, we're not trying to figure out what, what the previous issue caused us. And that helps in efficiency, that helps in service. Does this expansion, was that Incorporated in the original 1.6 million dollars of the uh, engineering. engineering. Yeah, so it's included. We broke that down to uh, the 740 thousand that was budgeted. Uh, that was uh, budgeted for that in the communication fiber expansion. So we we had planning, we had supply. We had software, and then we had actual going out and implementing that. And that was within that 740,000 that, that we had budgeted last year. And the proposal that we had, of course, that we would come to the board each time we'd make a progressive step, you know, we would discuss what that step would be, the merits of that step, the benefits of it, and of course, the cost. And this is so. What's going on? You have a project similar to this in Rangeley. We do. We proposed. It's it's not a, a subdivision like this. It's it's more of a kind of a scattered um, spots here and there. Um, just because you know we kind of stopped at certain points and based on takers of the original and and who wanted it. And so it's not going to be as clean as this being in one pathway, one road. We get it done it's going to be a little bit over here a little bit over there and in rangely uh what we're also doing right now is we're kind of doing a beta test with the uh with the crews we needed to do some fiber fix at columbine park and we needed to expand out the fiber network in columbine park that would allow us to add some additional cameras for that for security purposes and what's nice about that is it's it's our property, it's open. Um, and so we're gonna begin that next week where we, we do some transition with fiber. That way everybody has some experience with the equipment. We have some experience putting in the material. Um, and, and that a lot of that's covered under operations. So it's not, not within the, the broadband because it's within one of my facilities. And so it's, it's a nice proving ground and testing to 
do this before we go out and and are looking at you know being being efficient and cost efficient and labor efficient and, and having good systems for, for installing. What what are the plans this summer? Is, are we doing this project in Rangeley? If we if we well the the plan right now is July 10th we break ground on cross out. We would like to then flop over to the other side of and do Buckskin Valley, and then from there then we would move to Rangeley. Given the fact that we typically have a little bit longer uh, weather. Uh, window there in Rangeley. Um, we haven't quite dove into the Rangeley side and packaged it up. To tell you the truth, um, we're working through all the intricacies of cross sale, and and that's really going to kind of build our our job planning, and then and then we apply to Buckskin, and then we start applying it to Rangeley. Um, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, I really would like us and the team highly focused on making cross sales successful so that we don't overextend ourselves and we don't overpromise. This is an extremely big step for my department and operations and broadband. Uh, this is something that collectively we haven't ever done combined. Um, and so the general high level plan is, is that we we get cross sale done, we roll over to Buxkin Valley and then we move to Rangeland. However, right now it's making cross sales successful and getting this done so that we don't we don't leave on we don't you know lack of planning come across issues and and then of course we don't uh, we don't ever extend ourselves to make promises. We yeah. Do you you said that there were twenty one sites. Um, and, but not all of them currently have are on the wireless system. So those ones that aren't, do we know that they're going to want this? Have we had that conversation with them? So so we we started the conversation. I got to get going on the other side, but so we we met with the HOA. We started the conversation with the HOA. Uh, we handed out the easements, um, of course. We're still getting those filtered back in on those easements, and and so we haven't done a count of who's on the system, all the easements. I think we have a an area where we need to circle back around and say, okay, did you just not have time to get the easement in, or are you looking at different options? So we have to. We've met with the number. We haven't compared that to who we haven't met, and then we haven't gone through on making sure that we have talked with and and. Uh, Confirm that everybody is, is takers on this. Um, we have met with the majority of everybody. We just haven't gone through and systematically verified everything. So we certainly can do that. Yes. Okay, so I want to get talking about the team because we always do this. So um, the first thing is I think that um, this is indicative of, of my personality, and then of course it's. I think it's it's a common thing, um, right? Is you uh, you uh, you're in a room of a hundred hundred people and you get 99 positive comments and then there's the one criticism critique and you focus on that and then that becomes the narrative of what the the operation or the plan or the team is doing. And and I think in many ways that's good because that allows you to focus on where you can improve. But there's also a downside on it where it's really tough sometimes to step back, get perspective, and and of course give the accolades and and the the nods to to what the accomplishments and what we you know the accomplishments the team has done, right? Uh, and then of course it's always there's the reason the man in the arena speech is so popular is because it's true in many ways. It's much easier to criticize than it is to actually get done. So with with that being said, uh, the first thing is I'd like to do a shout out to our communications department. Um, Maxwell Dolly, Derek, uh, Aaron, Chance Walker, Sky Forsyth, and Dylan Merrill and Trevor, Trevor Nielsen. Um, 
when you look at what that team has accomplished, it's it's really easy to get hyper focused on on the high level stuff of should we be doing it, should we be doing it, what is the game plan, what is the long term plan. However, as as employees, as staff, as team members, they don't have a say in the big picture. What they have is their jobs. What they have is what's in front of them and what they can do to execute. And then you look at some comparisons, right? There's been many conversations where we had where there are large telecom companies that are brought into the same communications or the same dialect with what we're doing here in Rio Blanco County. But then you look at the comparisons and you say, a company like AT&T that's been in business for 100 years still isn't perfect. And then you look at the fact that the broadband project, uh, the network began in 2000. 15 with an idea and just recently within the last eight months did we actually take on some of the isp roles it's astounding what they do um you know uh maxwell in many ways is the heart soul and the back side of it where you have you have derek and chance um and uh and sky and dylan helping keep everybody going. Chance is our new broadband technician. He's the face on doing the installations. Um, we even have a number of shout outs. You know, we we have a, I wanted to bring, you know, we have some what we call attaboys where, you know, we have just recently, you know, people will email us and, and tell us how the customer service is good. We're responsive. Um, we have a, a email here from Miss Miller who uh, gives a nod on that we're one of the the easiest to work with internet companies she's ever done. And that we worked through it, and she was moving, and however we were supportive and what we needed to do, we notified her. Uh, we were there when we we needed to be, and we got done, and we were out. Right, and and they are doing an excellent job on on that, especially given the magnitude of what they have to do. And of course, we ask them to work on a diverse, you know, uh, platform of different scopes, responsibilities. Um, you have our IT information system department, which happens to be the same players, right? Like we take for granted that you can make a phone call in your office and they'll fix your computer in your county office. And then you go home and you make a call because you're internet at home and it is typically the same person answering the phone um, and they're resolving those issues. That is unique to Rio Blanco County. That's unique to Maker and Rangeley. Um, I did want to do a, a big shout out to, to Derek. You know, we, we take for granted that, you know, we say team, but he's really a man of an island out there in Rangeley. Um, his support is over an hour away. He is a lot of times by himself. Uh, he shows up, he has to get things accomplished and and prioritize and execute on items based on, you know, him being a one man show out there. And the team does an excellent job of supporting, but in many ways he's, he's by himself. And he does an excellent job out there, uh, keeping that system running and helping us uh, navigate through issues with it and customer response and service. And then he's doing his best to also wear that second hat of, if DHS happens to have an issue with their computers or with a router, he can, he can be there because it saves us two hours of sending someone from Meeker to potentially shut a system off and restart it. Um, on our side on custodial, um, we have Elsa uh, Garcia, Rachel Jastrin, and Maria Vieira, along with Shirley Kill. Um, they are doing an awesome job. I think uh, one of the telltale signs of a good custodial team is that the fact that you walk into our facilities and you don't notice a change, right? I mean, we have in our buildings, we have hundreds of people a day come and go. Um, we have inclement weather, we have mud, we have snow, we have ranchers, we, and the buildings all look the same. We go in, the paper's stocked, the, top, the restrooms are clean floors are clean, the, the facilities, the trash is taken care of, and it's done consistently day in, day out. And that's one of the toughest parts of that job is keeping that consistently high mark on doing that. Um, 
and they do they do an awesome job. Uh, along with facilities, you know, uh, we have Mark Litzelman, Ryan Kieran, Cody Stewart, Lindsey Hansen, Tanner Franks, and Kat Sullivan working in our facilities department. Um, we did a, a major cleanup at Columbine Park this spring. A lot of it was recouping from being short staffed through the winter and a heavy winter. Uh, we went and the team uh, disassembled the old community pens out at the, uh, um, now I believe it is, it's, company owns it, yeah, Scout. Um, you know, they just recently are finishing up some new raised counter beds out in front of Redino. Uh, like I said, we are looking at addressing a few water issues out at Columbine Park and doing an installation of fiber uh, expansion out there. Um, there's new signage. Um, overall, we're we're doing really well. The facilities look really good. And and again, you know, that's Cody Stewart and Lindsey Hansen, who a lot of times when your bosses are 60 miles away, I mean, your motivation has to has to be with them to to keep moving and get things done. And, and they are doing an awesome job. And then you have here in Meeker where you have Ryan Kieran, who is a special individual. Um, I've never seen anyone. He essentially had a six month uh, interview process. We hired uh, Ryan last year in the beginning of spring as a seasonal with no guarantee that the job would ever become full time. I did not see a waiver in work ethic or what this, this individual has accomplished through that whole six month period. Uh, he didn't actually get notified until, I think it was the second to the last day of seasonal position was ending that he had been uh, given or offered the full-time employee job. And and what's awesome about Ryan is that, you know, he's taken on uh, a leadership role here in, in Maker, which has allowed uh, myself and Mark to, to take on some of the other challenges of of working with the broadband to help them expand their system and to do some other projects. Uh, one of the things the facility accomplished early this year was we did a remodel of the front office of Road and Bridge, allowed us to do new data networking cables, a new security access system, a new HVAC system. And a lot of that work was done, um, a lot of the, the labor work was done internally with our staff and, and that, that has to do with good good staff to be able to do that. If they showed up just wanting to do their day-to-day -day job and not have to think, we wouldn't be able to accomplish those types of tasks. Um, I'm pretty sure that I didn't even touch base on all the accomplishments the operations department has done. I mean, just implementing uh, vitro um, getting that coordinated and that system in there with Trevor and his team and, and like you guys have seen, we still have a long way to go to get all the information we need in there. We're trying to get all the, the easement deeds tied to these property addresses. We're trying to get all the fiber uh, splices and, and all that information in, all the house drops. Um, we also have implemented new management systems with uh, a system called monday.com that does basically manages across the board. And that was a big question that the commissioners had last year when we were consolidating is how are you guys gonna keep such a diverse team communicating, being on the same, the same, uh, the same page? And it was a question we at the time didn't have an answer to. And, and we searched and searched and we kind of knew that we needed a communication platform and we found Slack, which is what we use for a, a team collaboration communication. So it's kind of across the board of email, text, uh, just general conversation, updates that allows everybody to kind of know. We, we use it to keep in coordination with Cimarron so that Cimarron has this this pipeline directly to our broadband that says anytime they, they need something and they have an issue, it pops up on there. And then of course that ties to the use of Monday where even Cimarron has access to Monday. So as, as issues come in or fiber needs to be uh, replaced or addressed, they are able to put it in. We manage our projects. Um, we also, uh, use it to manage our 
our uh, our expenses and our budget tracking. And I had a roll going there for a second, didn't I? Oh, here we go. Help if I'm right. I'll just uh, throw a shout out to Maria because she also brings snacks as well as clean, like really phenomenal stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and that, that really helps, you know, uh, they did a shout out. We did a pancake breakfast, you know, along with uh, Scott and <clears throat> Public Works and, and Don and, and uh, County Administration. Um, that doesn't happen like because you know the three of us. It happens because of our teams, and they make it easy. Because right, if if we're doing that something like that where it's it's above, then the employees chip in and and they do it above what's required of their jobs. And then you know everybody has breakfast and they leave, and then the staff they go and they they clean up and then they go and start their day job and. Those things I think are important to uh, to uh, bring team collaboration to to improve uh, improve morale. But we also like got to acknowledge that it's a lot of work, and, and that's not done just by us. It's done by our our staff, and, and they make it happen. Um, if this is it's running a little slow. So you clearly can see my budgets happen to be a little complicated. But you know what's nice about this system is day to day we enter in our expenses. So day to day we know where we're at in all the many budgets that we have uh, across the county. And this is vital because one, we know that we're remaining within budget, and it allows us to be agile in, in the decision making we have. Right. So when something pops up and we need to ask, you know, do we have budget? We know immediately. Right, we don't have to. And if you look at the ENCODE system, which is a great system, it still can be 45 to 60 days behind what the expenses actually occur. I mean, if you think about it, us signing a contract, we've committed our PO, we've committed those dollars, and it might be another three months before those committed dollars, we have something on site or something done, and and we need to know that we've already spent that money long before it shows up in ENCODE or Janae's not coming. So. I think the team's done an awesome job. I'm always running to catch up with them. Again, uh, broadband and communication, full plate IT uh, information systems, our custodial, um, and then our facility management. And of course, then we have let our partners with the airports, with Lanny Coulter and Coulter Aviation, and ENCC with the college and helping us manage them, and Wesley out there at the range. So, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for you and your staff's job, Eric. But I also think that you need a shout out for managing all of that and being a good leader and and making it happen. And you still have a half an hour, so keep Do going. I have a half yeah, hour? if you go till nine thirty on my you go to nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. It's on my paper. Did you get the new one? Mine says 915. Mine says 915. Oh, I gave you the wrong one. This is the other one. Never mind. 915. Why is here? We have the radio discussion that was going to be on the workshop a little bit later. First, I want to tell Eric kudos for, for what you and your department do. I know that. When I come to you a lot, it's, it might be with a problem, but that doesn't mean that I, I don't appreciate the good work and everybody. You're correct. We have a, a really good team in Real Blanket. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and you manage them we, very well. We appreciate do a lot in, in the Real Blanco that, that they wouldn't even consider in other counties. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, He's also been very helpful with the MCCI support, some of the issues we have. 
and one that we discussed a couple of issues yesterday in our meeting, and one of them with regard to the sprinkler system. So I guess Pat Hughes is the person that will be doing that, and we don't have a contract. You guys don't have a contract work either. And so that was raised as a concern. Um, after that meeting, we discussed it with Mark. I think, uh, you know, what we're what we're planning on doing with Mark was going to meet with Pat. Um, we did some revisions to the original scope. Um, Pat was going to get him those revisions to the scope and that estimate, and we were going to. I feel that it'll fall under our procurement policy of being able to issue a PO, so I don't think it will need a formal agreement. However. Um, uh, because we, we I understand. Just, we just, I mean, we are so confused sometimes. It's just trying to learn. Um, and I, I understand these are these are things that we discussed after the meeting. So uh, Mark was going to let Pat know that we don't want to proceed forward with with any work until we had that price quote in hand, and then we were able to issue that uh, that PO. However, if it was to come over the fifteen thousand dollars, which is the limit that I have. The original scope, I believe, was twenty thousand. Um, then we would come to the board for an official agreement for services. Uh, this is a slightly different because it's it's MCCIC's money on the county's property. So um, we probably the easiest thing is to lean towards the procurement policy of the county. However, you know, it's it's one of those things where it it's a little bit gray area and I think that's that's probably the reason this kind of fell through the cracks of it being their money but our property and so I don't feel any issues with getting it cleaned up but we do want to clean it up before you know how you know how Eric is with Greg. <laughs> um I have a question though. Since it is county property, um what is the county property? Does M C C I C is are they responsible? For the care of, or for the replacement or whatever it needs to be done with that sprinkler system. Because you guys take, or said you were going to be responsible for the ground. So isn't that part of the ground? Am I right? I think they got a grant for it out of the Fairfield board. So again, it's going to be one of those where it's all bottom. But if they're not. You know, I mean, we're trying to get ourselves lined up and trying to figure out what exactly are we responsible for and what exactly is the county going to be responsible for. And we're all struggling trying to figure this out. Um, and I may be the only one that's struggling. I don't know. I think within that agreement, it's um, like the bigger capital items would come up during budget and they'd be subject to budget appropriation every single year. Um, so any of those kind of bigger capital um, projects. As far as maintenance, I think normal wear and tear of like what's going on within the apartments, I believe in the contract, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's MCCIC. Right. Um, and then, so anything else Kind of outside of that scope i think one we've got to have it within budget so budget discussion is going to be very beneficial kind of moving forward for making sure that we know what projects are up and coming we can plan for them we can put them in a five-year plan if we need to that sort of thing so um i think that's so that's, that's the way kind of yeah that's the way it's uh, uh designed is so if, if something happens big ticket capital improvement item and it's got to go through the commissioners and budget that has to be appropriated and everything else. You guys are responsible for wear and tear. So, you know, general maintenance, painting, you know, that type of thing. You know, of course, yeah. we bleed over anyway. You know, uh, uh, Eric's uh, uh, crew, you know, helps with a lot of that stuff. But those are the type of things that you need to uh, just kind of consider. The And, you know, as we go along in the process, we're hoping to figure out you know how to separate it more, make it a, a where MCCIC is more of a standalone right. versus a, on the county's end. But but today that's kind of what we're doing. We're trying to get a transition there that keeps you guys going in the way that you need to be going, and then eventually gets the 
uh, or, or the county's uh, uh, obligations limited as far as NCCIC goes? I, I think also uh, this uh, this this partnership can be done in the same facets as are some of our other partners. Like I, for example, the college and the management of the airport, where sometimes they have priorities that they want to see done. They have funding sources to get those done, and as long as they allow the county to, you know, be aware of those projects to have input on those projects, they proceed forward. So if, if the irrigation system, for example, even though the maintenance of the landscaping is the county's responsibility, the irrigation system is a priority of NCCIC, you guys are more than welcome to explore those funding sources like I believe you did with the Freeman Fairfield Fund grant and get those funds secured, identify the scope and, and get that done for the improvement and the betterment of, of the facility. And, and we will gladly supply our input and, and of course, any type of additional resources that we need to help get it done and done um, to the highest level. But, you know, I see many ways that you guys can have your priorities and where you want to get your money and where you want to focus those funds. And then we'll have ours. And then, of course, where we need to come together on cooperative projects as long as we have a good relationship. We can move forward, in. and I think that's going to be the betterment of the, the facility for the for the residents. Hi, Jack. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Throw on a radio conversation now. Gonna be one minute. Yeah. <laughs> We'll make it back. Well, you were going to do that. Is that your update at 10, though? No. Oh. It's part of it, but Eric's part of the radio conversation, so that's why I was wondering. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, speaking with Gwen, um, we had a number of radios at Road and Bridge go down. Um, they're looking at having to replace those. There's uh, a number of radios that are in question on how long they're going to be. Six are dead right now. And they identified another six that were on the critical list. So we were looking to see if we could get 12 radios. So. And, uh, and and then there was some confusion on especially the fact that we have budgeted a communi public communications position within the operations department. You know, who makes the call? How does this work? And, and, and the reality is, is that uh, for many years, both the sheriff's office, road and bridge, and kind of a collective of, of our IT department have kept the radio systems going for, for our departments. Um, we, we do still believe that consolidation of that division under my department is, is, is the best path. And we believe that there's a position needed for management of our radio systems uh, across across the county and of course also for our other uh, anchor institutes like uh, fire and rescue. Uh, however, I don't think jumping on that because we need to replace some radios from the bridge is, is, is needed to make this decision. So my recommendation to Road and Bridge is they said that they have 12 radios. There was a question of doing refurbished versus doing new. I think uh, the refurbished is of course half the cost of new. Uh, my and and I think the the new came in at like thirty six hundred dollars a radio, um, and so my recommendation is hey buy the radios get them replaced I feel that we should buy new and and then we proceed forward how we always done and got them programmed through through Cody Henry and his company he does an excellent job for the county and and what we need to do I think on the the larger picture is is really sit down and understand this division in our mind, public communications, roles, responsibilities, what are our measurable outcomes from that? And then of course that ties to this job description. But I think for this this interim condition, you buy the radios, we get a program and we get them in use. That's my that's my recommendation. How many spares does Road and Bridge have, if any? Um, right now we don't have any spares. Um, but if all, all 12 of these were replaced with new ones, how many spares would you have? 
Would you want those dual band? Are they all handheld or mobiles? They're handheld. I, my thought is that they, they wouldn't need to be dual band, uh, just given, you know, however, we there are. Really need that. Really the, the two main areas that I'm aware of with the, the dual band needs when the 800 system is working is, is near Kinney Reservoir and Creek Tower site. Thinking more like the fires and yeah. stuff like that. Do we use, we get those radios for like search and rescue and fires and stuff? Is that, are they used that way? Is that what you think? Yeah, that like the BLM and stuff. Well, if, Roden Bridge is going out <clears throat> on a fire, um, then they need their main to keep it from being like a, a leapfrog. They they need direct communication. Right. And that's we, we have two of those currently. Two or, dual bands? Yes. Handheld? Right. So that would give us, you know, supervisory connection to the nation. Okay. Definitely. I don't know what would open up a grand opportunity if we looked at it as a dual band for getting some radios. Mm -hmm. um, Are they a bunch more expensive? Yeah. I think they're around six for dual band. Quite a bit. And we have the but, budget for it. So for these, we don't current, like they're not within the budget, budgeted, so we need to take it to the state to replace the 12 currently. But we did put money in fund balance. So I could just decrease that this next go around for whatever we use to pay for this year. And then hopefully, I mean, the whole thought process was, was to get that position in place so then they could go through all of our inventory, put together a plan of replacement because we pretty much got them all at the same time. I think all of them within one or two years of each other. So Sheriff's Office did get grant funds this year, so they are replacing a good plethora of theirs. So I think we're, we're good there. It's going to be more fleet, road and bridge that we're going to have to look at replacing within this year, next year, sort of thing. Was that your radios work for us? I was just going to ask, thank you. I think those are all dead, and that's yeah. why we're replacing. Is They're like correct? end of life. Same, same as yours. Problems, like we're spending a lot more money on trying to fix them than it would be. I, I think all of them are like that 10, like between 8 and 12 yeah. years old. I actually asked Anthony that last week. Are, are they, or do they, are there, do they have some of them? Yeah. But I think they're getting away from the dual band handhelds and going in the car, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but putting VHF, a separate VHF radio and a separate 800 in the vehicles. That's what they're starting to yeah. do. And it's, it's hard because if you have, if you're on VHF on your handheld, 
you're not hearing any home tone. So it kind of defeats the purpose. And, and of course, the user needs to be trained with those are and understand that the systems are dual band and also what are the capabilities of DHF versus data. We have some different coverages. Yeah, and the coverages problem that's why we would have them to do them. Sorry. Well, we need to mention also that you know, the, the handheld is not the only radios we have. We have 100, over 120, about 120 of the mobile radios are in all our groups. They're getting close to end of life too. We've got a lot of those out through there. I wonder if I gave him Mick's contact from Eagle County. Mm -hmm. He's the radio guy there, and maybe you can have that conversation with him. Well, so we, we've actually written what the division scope would be for public communication, and we've written the job description. What we would like to do is sit down and have a, a work session with the board and, and the invested entities to make sure that we're on the same page of this is what that division will uh, you know, this is this is the services and and the goals of what this division will do. And then, of course, with that staff, this is this is what that job description is. And one of the things, of course, that pops up into that is, uh, you know, we we supply the budget for the individual. However, uh, where's the budget for purchase services, supplies, and uh, and then of course support because. That you just heard today that there's that there's going to be a, a big picture of gathering all the information together into one source which i think is what we need and developing that plan um and then so there's probably going to be a timeline of expectations on what what we want to do and we we want to given the fact that we've gone so long without having to centralize we wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page we were being realistic on the expectations we knew what the objections were of the uh, that we needed to execute on, and then that way we can then manage because there's going to be outside invested entities outside of real Long Beach County's own departments on things that we need to uh, we need to uh, get done for. So uh, we have that written. We have a and and you know I can send that on to to anyone else that you think for review. But I would like to sit down and then that way. Before we ever hire someone in, we know that clear path the best that we can for for marching forward and how we're going to submit them. Because the last thing we want to do is hire this really great individual and we fail to support them and the equipment they need, the fleet they need, purchase services, potential training, all licensing. I mean, there's a bucket there. And then of course, you know, uh, that relationship with with Mr. Henry on on the you know, services he's provided with the county and understanding how that that transitions over so we're ready to have that discussion you know once my staff comes back you know trevor being a key part of that and uh and i think uh you know the later part of july would be a really great time when everybody gets back from holiday to to sit down and make sure that we're all on the same page and we haven't jumped the gun or or there's not any uh, gray areas did they really have a copy of that yeah i can send i can forward it on to you Okay, so um, for the sake of time, sorry, we need to move on. Um, let's go back to the 12 radios. Um, but yes, I agree, let's get them on the work session so we can have that discussion on that position because that was going to be one of my questions because I haven't seen it listed. Um, so are we good with like getting an estimate on the 12 radios 12. so we kind of know what we're looking at? 12 radios, a lot of radios. Are, how are you getting by now if you need 12 radios? For the six, we're down to six, so we are, um, thankfully, we're down two people, too, so um, we're using everything that we have. Um, the other six are taking extra batteries and replacing the batteries throughout the day, um, making it work right now. Um, we do have people in the trucks that have radios communicating with people on the rovers times, but you want us to do six? We're good with six. Well, I, I, 
I guess it, I would ask that if you think that you're going to need some dual bands to make some of them be that way, I would hate to spend a lot of money and then figure out that we have some pop up and then all of a sudden we need radios and we just bought a bunch and they're not what we need. We look into that. Um, to keep this this moving on on the critical, can I recommend that we we make a direction where we have a, a set sum because we know we have an estimate of. I believe 3,600 for 12 radios, which is a total of. But that's not programming, too. How much is it going to cost to program? Well, we're going we're gonna to get there. Okay. 20,406 $20, dollars is what the quote was. We haven't gotten the quote back from Motorola yet. But was it landfill again yesterday? Is that fine? Can we can we get moving and say this is a density item of 40,000 dollars, and then we will. Uh, we will have a quote done for 12 radios, programming, and an answer of whether or not 12 of those radios need to be dual band with the expectation that dual band don't cost the radio. Okay. Not necessarily 12 of them, but a portion. Yeah, so if we if we go with 10 and we do two a tool, a dual band, then it becomes a math problem. But 3600 at 12 is 43.2, so you're already over. The quote that we got. I think those are for the refurbished, aren't they? Because they were like 1600. It might have been. Did you get the quote back from Motorola on the new ones? Okay. In light of, can we maybe continue this discussion a little bit till Scott's time period? Because we've already got Michaela on and we need to get through Sean first. Thank you. All right, Ms. Sean. I don't have much. Person recorder, yeah. electric. That's why you use most of your time. You should. How are you guys? Good. Yeah, How are you? Good. Okay. So I just have a little bit of stuff. Um, I know that at one of the last board meetings, Trevor brought up the dot gov um, for the end of um, for our emails. That was brought up to us. Um, at our last um, conference to change that over for security purposes. So I believe that that got passed through and he's just waiting for state to get back to him for the ending of it, how, how it's going to end. So I know that that is coming up and it'll be a transition and I apologize, but it was for the best going forward. Um, the July 11th meeting is when we'll approve the, or hopefully get the approval for the district lines, the boundary lines being moved. Um, I actually haven't even had one person ask me about it, which is odd to me. I can't believe somebody didn't bring it up. And we ran that in the newspaper mm -hmm. and it's been on the agenda mm -hmm. twice. Mm -hmm. So, and then the last one on the 11th, we'll do a public hearing mm -hmm. then to catch any public comment. But. Yeah. So, I mean, I really don't know what people would have to say, but I was assuming that somebody was going to have something to say. So I was pleasantly surprised that nothing was. Um, we only have one election this year um, in November, and we're already, it's a small election, so I'm very thankful for that <laughs> going forward. But um, we are starting to do stuff with um, Dominion and Gore. The change, one of the changes that we're going to have this year is we always, we always print our stuff, our ballots in our office, and then Jean's printing would bring up, they would do the inside envelope, the outside envelope, and the uh, security sleeves that go around all of your ballots. And this year we're going to try and have it sourced out through Jean's printing and have them do everything. Um, it was budgeted for, so um, hopefully, hopefully that runs as smooth as I hope, because next year we have three elections, and they're big elections, so we're going to have to pick and choose our battles um, for that next year. Um, just went through, obviously went through the sessions, and there's going to be some law changes. They haven't done the rulemaking yet, so we're waiting for the rule changes to come through from the Secretary of State to see how they're going to implement. 
we are doing just first one. Um, we are doing we got the grant funding for the pads that are going to go on the outside and inside of any election rooms. Um, so anyone that has anything to do with um, elections is going to have a key card. Same like as what we have here and when they go in, they're going to tap it and when they go out, they're going to tap it and it's going to have a running log. Um, for any for anything and I. I have a feeling that we'll probably get a couple of core requests after we implement this and get it going. I like the fact that we're going to have that. The way we did it before was just a piece of paper on the wall. And when you came in, you signed your name, the date and the time. And sometimes we have to we had to bring them back in and have them sign it. Um, so I'm excited. It's been a big project for Eric and maintenance. So. Um, very much appreciated. They haven't put it in yet, but their next couple of months is when we have to have it in by. I don't want them to put it in a month before and have an issue. So hopefully they'll get in the next couple of months. Um, I have been implementing using, um, putting stuff in the newspaper for information. A lot of people have questions on just how to, how to take their name off of the list or someone's been deceased and it hasn't come off our list yet. We've been putting little blurbs in the paper, so I'm hoping that people are seeing that and utilizing that. And if you guys ever have anything that if somebody comes up to you and asks a question about elections, first of all, actually have them call us first so we can get the right information. Not saying that your information is wrong, but make sure it comes through us. And then um, second, I want to be able to, if somebody says, you know, we don't know how to do this or What's the process? If that's something that we keep hearing stuff on, I want to get it out in the paper so that people can, everyone can see it. Because if one person's asking, you probably got 50. Um, so Nikki at the newspaper has been very kind in getting it in without charging us. She's putting it in like the little, a little section that she has space for. Um, Are you um, putting it in the Rangeley Review too? No, just the just the Herald Times. I would suggest putting it in the range. I mean, she does a monthly. Who's that? Uh, Judy Caldwell. Judy Caldwell. Mm -hmm. And it's the Rangeley Review. Uh -huh. You don't have any contact information for her. I can okay. forward it to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. I have no problem doing that. Um, we just got an update um, on one of our Zoom calls. They're potentially talking about doing um, a flat fee for recording. Right now it's $13 for the first page and $5 for the second. And then $5 whatever after that. And they're trying they're putting their feelers out there right now to see if they want to do a flat fee for recording. I don't know how that will work. We only have a couple of times a year that we have 400 pages or you know or more. So there's only a couple of times, but um, I think they're trying to get everybody to do it um, electronically is what they're pushing for. It's the time spent scanning 400 or 900 pages. It takes a hot minute to get that all back in order and, and keep going. So I, I think there's a lot of positivity there. Um, can't read my own writing. Sorry. Oh, our rulemaking is in progress. Um, that should be finished here within the next month, and then we'll we'll be going forward. I met with Eddie uh, Persina yesterday on our security plan. I didn't, I haven't been able to find what we do in case of an emergency. And after the line broke over here, um, I panicked a little because I didn't know what would we we would have done. I had it in the right mind that it would gone down to the Fairfield, but they were down too. So I didn't know. So Eddie and I sat down and spoke about that and we're going to get updated. All the names on the list right now are no one works in the office anymore. So we have to get all those names taken out and the new names put on. Yeah. Hello? Uh, whoever's on the phone, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, I think that's it. I know you touched on it briefly, but with the uh, lawsuit with the state 
and all of that, are, are you actively trying to clean up the voter rolls? Absolutely. <laughs> um, we've had um, a lot of discussions with them and we are, I'm doing as much as I can on my end for our side. I guess that's the only way I can say it. Um, Rio Blanco County is, it, this is not the problem. We are not the problem. It is out in the bigger areas, 50,000 plus, where if three things slide by, they don't get noticed. Here, they get noticed. Um, and a lot of that, so a lot of the stuff in the newspaper has to do with helping get stuff cleaned up. We have a lot of people that keep bringing up the same fact that, well, so-and-so got a, a voter registration, but they live in Georgia or New Mexico or wherever. And it is all on the voter. It is not up to us to change someone's information for them. They have to contact us to tell us to do it. And so I know there's a lot of disconnect there that people don't realize that even if someone in passing says, oh, hey, Sean moved to Massachusetts, take her off the list. And in fact, I didn't. So we have to have it from the actual person. Um, a lot of moms want to do it for their kids. They can give the information to their children, but the children have to do it. So that was one of the inserts that we put in the paper was to make sure that people understood that just because you know the information doesn't make it that you're going to do the information. It has to come from the voter themselves. But they actually have to go online, and I know I did. Yes. And you even caught that my address was incorrect yes. even before I came to you. Yes. So I know that you are working on that. Yes. We have a little a couple of issues. That. You're welcome. A couple of issues with the streets and what they're named and how the post office thinks that that is. So um, we're trying to get those cleaned up as well. And once we get the um, district lines approved and we get that in there, then I have about a month's work worth of work to clean up the actual address library. And so once we get through that and get those moved, the district stuff moved then um, more stuff will come into play. And that's why we need to get this done before the end of July is because I have to go in and then do stuff to move those lines and to get stuff cleaned up for people. I don't, I don't want to prolong this, but I just have a question. Um, if someone uh, moves and they don't notify you and they get a ballot and they vote, is that illegal? Yes. And how, what do we do about that? on the voter. Um, so the voter if has we, to say that I'm doing something illegal and slap me? Which they're not going to. No. So, you know. Isn't it only illegal if they vote if they're new residents? I was thinking that they had, so they can't vote twice, but if you vote at your, where you're currently registered, right? You can't vote, like if you move to Ohio and you, for whatever reason, your mom puts it in the, because they're not portable. Your, right. Those are not portable. So they come back to us if they don't live there anymore. But say the mom grabs it and sends it to them and you've lived there for six months. You're not a resident of Rio Blanco County and you're not a resident of Colorado. And that is voter fraud, okay. 100%. And so it's on them. And so being a small county, we know everybody. It's horrible because I'm like, well, I know she doesn't live here anymore. So what we try to do is reach out to people and send a letter and say, hey, I know you live in Texas. Can you go ahead and go online and, you know, take yourself off the voter list? And they will. We've had um, roughly about 10 people that we've gotten a hold of that said we didn't know we had to do that. So that's why we're trying to get stuff out into the paper. And to the what public. about deceased? Deceased comes directly from the CDPHE. We used to have an ERIC list that would download each month, but now they've taken that away and it goes through and we got, and we get a report once a month and then we go through and process. We had nine last month. Like we just did nine people. Hmm. Unbelievable. If, but we, if we know there's voter fraud though, do we report it to the law enforcement? Agency? We absolutely should. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the way yep. it, I've always seen it. That yep. Yes, we can it. report if we know for sure and that they had voted, absolutely. Now, if they receive a ballot, that's one thing. But if they vote the ballot, 
that's right. the other. Yeah, receiving the ballots, you can do Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and they could just, you know, and a lot of people want to send them back to us with a note on the outside of the ballot. That, again, does not, they have to take responsibility for their own actions and go take themselves off of it. So. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, guys. Thanks for the update. Alrighty. Do you guys need a break? We're good. Move on. Okay. Okay. Not dying yet. <laughs> no so, one needs first thing of water. Yeah. We are moving on to public health. Michaela, sorry, we were running a little behind. Um, you have a request for increased public health staffing. Yes. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, and thank you. Okay. Um, so, oh, oh, I was just going to tell them that you ran it by me, and then I talked to my, the administrators about it. So it's been vetted in that regard too. Okay, thanks, Don. So yeah, I am here to request another public health nurse. Um, I just wanted to update you guys on a couple things. We have posted the retail food um, job. And I'm actually interviewing someone for that tomorrow. Um, so we kind of have the ball rolling on that. I know that's something that you guys wanted me to do. Um, and then we also have some changes going on within public health. Um, our public health educator and budget specialist will be leaving on June 28th. And also our um, LPN, is not coming back from medical leave. So I'm pretty much losing two people kind of simultaneously. So I am requesting to get another public health nurse. Um, so I, I ran the budget with, by Janae. Um, we have about $4,448 that we would need additionally for 2023. Um, but because of the changes in staffing, I think that this number will probably change a little bit. I just haven't had a chance to get those numbers together um, because this has all happened within the last week. So um, but I can talk to Janae more and I don't think that we would have a problem now um, with the additional budget needed for 2023. Correct. Michaela, are you planning on um, refilling any of those other positions? Um, Is it so, kind of dependent upon that? So the, L, the LPN, um, no, because the RN would take, take the place of that position. Um, and then the budget specialist also, no, I will be taking over those duties. So I would say she has plenty of budget to be able to cover that. 40, 40 hour week uh, RN? 40 hour week RN is what we're proposing. Um, and then Michaela, I'm, I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that we discussed. That uh, uh, RN could do more things. She can work more independent than the, uh, than the LPN. Um, she doesn't need the supervision, a direct supervision that Michaela has to provide or another RN has to provide an LPN in that situation. So she would be able to do more. Michaela's discussed also using her for other things that would benefit the community. And one of the things specifically we talked about is the uh, uh, idea that you know a lot of seniors need to have weekly uh, well checks. They need to have their blood pressure and, and, and all of their vitals uh, done. And right now they have to go up and pay a $35 copay. What Michaela would like to do eventually, probably not the first week she gets a, a, a new uh, RN in, but what she'd like to do eventually is to offer those in, in the uh, public health offices so they can come in and get those. They don't have to pay that $35 copay, a uh, matter of just getting the vitals checked on a, on a weekly or, or whatever basis they're required to do, um, which I think would be a pretty big benefit to the county on top of having that those other services that we're going to make sure that we have qualified people to do, such as the vaccines and things of that nature. Is that adequately stated, Michaela? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. 
So would the RN be in Mika or in Rangeley is my first question. And second question is how confident at the hourly rate that you're proposing do you think that you could hire an RN? So the hourly rate that I'm proposing, I, I don't know if Jenny already said this, but it's it would be $36 an hour at 40 hours. Um, and I would hire a nurse in Meeker or Rangeley. Um, we do have a new WIC educator that does live in Rangeley. So we that has helped us out for staff in Rangeley. Um, but as far as the nurse, I would hire in either location. It just kind of depends on who, which location applied for it. How, at the $36 an hour, how confident are you that you can get an RN? I'm very confident. I feel, like, I feel like that's a very competitive wage um, for, for, for an RN. Okay. So if we're not, re so essentially what you're doing is for the RN position is that you're changing the job description from the LPN to an RN position? Is that what we're doing? Well, that? We're, I guess what I don't want to see happen is we, I guess what I've seen happen in other departments is we're, we're taking, we're not going to fill this position and then down the road, they want to fill that position. And so I just want to make sure that if, if that's truly where we're saving money, so to speak, by not replacing it and then down the road wanting to replace it, if that makes any sense yeah. to anybody. I just want to make sure that we're keeping a pretty tight ship in that area. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things we've, we've discussed. The, the uh, RN position uh, was originally what it was, and they were they had a hard time filling that. So uh, they, they modified the description to allow a, a, a LPN. And so, that was that's been a struggle ever since they've done it, even under Karen and then when Michaela uh, came in. So that's always been a struggle to have that, just because of the the things they can't do. So so that LPN is going to completely go away, that, from my understanding, right, Michaela? Yes. So so that will no longer be an authorized. At least that's my understanding. That will no longer be an authorized position. So we just can't step in and hire them unless we go back through the process. And justify and then get uh, a commissioner approval for that new position. I don't think we're going to completely do away with the educator uh, uh, right now, at least that's what my, my, my thought would be, to at least keep the position as a, as a potential open position um, and see how Michaela is able to deal with all of her, her duties and responsibilities because she's getting into uh, a budget season, uh, but she's both the state. Uh, a, a, a federal uh, year-end uh, information that she's going to have to provide and things like that. So I don't want to overload her being as new as she is in that position until she knows that she's got a good handle on it. And, and then at that time, we can look at whether or not we need to fill the educator, the, that second educator position, or whether or not we can do with current staff. That's, that's what my, my hope is. And so I wouldn't necessarily want to foreclose that as a possibility, but it, it can be done with our existing staff and that would not be, be hired. I, I would like to, if you do this, I'd like to see you move the job descriptions around so that they're filled with the people you have and that would take care of your yeah. answer, right? Yeah. And I think that would be, be appropriate. I think we probably ought to look at those job descriptions for budget anyway to make sure we have the right people in the right positions that we're not, you know, sometimes and I think it's happened in public health probably as much or more than any other position. You get somebody that's good, and so you kind of uh, 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 change their job description to fit the person rather than the, the position. And I think we've got a little of that now, so we probably look at them and make sure that we have the the right job description for the right uh, positions. And Michaela and I can work on that. Yeah. Remember, you're kind of looking at three different positions as it currently stands, because we had a 40 hour a week person who was doing the, um, oh, the, the food inspection, food inspection yeah. along with some like environmental health stuff. And then, so you have that position. You also have the 32 hour a week at the end position. And now you have a 32 hour a week um, budget kind of specialist educator position. So I would say, 
I would agree. Leave one of those kind of open. I think you have enough money within kind of those two positions to formulate your your 40-hour RN without adding additional funds. But also through public health, they just extended the ELC for another year. They're giving a few more, you know, some more money down the road. So I think grant-wise, you're covered um, at least for these next maybe year or two. And then you can really figure out, you know, where you're going at that point. You may go back to where you do need more of an admin position within public health, like we had pre-COVID. Um, and so I, I think it's, I think just leave some money in there aside for something at some point in time. And another thing we're looking at is to to turn that uh, other uh, uh, educator slash everything else position back into a 40-hour position. And we talked about that. I don't know. We made a decision whether that's necessary yet or whether uh, that's something that uh, the employee would want to go into that. But that's a, that's a conversation that we had as well as try to maybe do that as a 40 hour rather than as a 32 and, you know, get a better bang for our dollars in that position as well. So at the end, we'd have a 40 hour RN, potentially a 40 hour uh, uh, educator slash other things position. And then uh, 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 a part-time WIC, a part-time uh, uh, food inspector, and kind of work those job duties uh, around between the existing people, see how that works. And the thing can make it more efficient as well as make it more beneficial for the county. Yeah. So I, I guess I also, so we're talking about an RM, but I thought I read somewhere along the way too that we're asking for an additional admin person. Uh, is that Am admin I or misunderstanding food? that? Uh, uh, for that food inspection uh, 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 position, but I think that's uh, being absorbed by a position we already have. I okay, so, so this is just the RM. Yes, yeah, I think this is just the RM. Okay. Is that right, Michaela? Yeah. This is just for the RN position. Yeah, I think in, in I think in the justification form, which we worked on, I think that part of it is is, is she was trying that we, we were trying to demonstrate through that justification form what we had and, and the resources that we had and what we were using already, so you guys would have a better understanding of that to make the decision. Taylor, when you first started, you said that you were looking for a food inspection person. What what we did I misunderstand you? Yeah, so we have had that job posted for a while. Um, and I actually have, I'm interviewing someone tomorrow for that. So um, we are trying to get that filled. I know that that's something that you guys wanted me to work on. So um, I am trying to to get that filled so it's not at the state level. Yeah, it's a, the state right now coming in and doing it for us. We, we had a, a position that... Uh, <laughs> The, the person left uh, a, a few months ago, that, that was part of the duties, but she had never trained up to work to do that. So we want to get somebody in-house to do it. Because that was one of the things that when we had talked about this earlier, that was a concern to the, the board. Sounds like you guys, as long as it's within the budget, it sounds like it's going to be just because you're not filling some of these other positions too. Yeah, I'm good. As, yeah. long, as, as long as we get job descriptions like around to where we're organized and know what everybody's doing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give it to Michaela and we'll go through that and uh, make sure those are developed. Right now. Give it Laura as well and make sure we've got everything we need for those positions. Okay. Yep. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> All righty. So we are going to take a five minute break and be back at 10 o'clock. We need a little break, Scott. Sorry. Anyone?
All righty, so we are back with Scott Marsh doing administrator updates for Public Works, and Dave Overton is here as well. Um, so the landfill has started doing all their build out uh, and Corey would love it. If you guys would come out, he'd love to give a tour. He was all happy when we came out there the other day. He took us around, showed us everything. But, um, Ferris oil and gas has increased their volume. Um, Chevron's also starting to haul. Um, Chevron right now is doing a lot of concrete and a lot of pipe, trying to get everything cleaned up, and then they'll start hauling all the drill cuttings and all that um, after they get that cleaned up. Um, so then our business will really pick up. Like yesterday, we, we had $15,000 a day out there just off of Karis. So it's starting to come in pretty hot and heavy. Um, and the landfill is doing everything by themselves because scrapers showed up early. Um, and we have everybody else magging and doing culverts and everything else. So um, we originally had budgeted for some road bridge people to go out and help with that. But since they're busy, landfill's doing it all. And they are doing a really nice job. Um, Corey's taken that and ran with it and done amazing. Um, Where's the uh, Chevron stuff coming from? Is that Wilson Creek? There's two different locations. So I'm not, one's Wilson Creek, but I don't know where the other one's at. Um, we got the two scrapers. Um, they did both go down for a little bit. They got back up. Um, we have been having a little bit of issue with cap filters, it seems like. Do you feel filters on the caps or just big plug you can, and it's not it's not uh, just one piece of equipment's motivators it's loaded on the you know and loaded the scrapers the dozer um, the dozer about every 85 hours you put fuel filters on and uh, they should go much longer than that so i talked to cat about it they're looking into it um i'm going to try some different filters we uh we actually filter the fuel when we pump it out of our system pumped into the transfer tank in the pickup, and we filter it again when we pump it out of that tank. So we're, we're pretty about 95% sure it's not on our end. There's something going on with the filters. So, and we're not having issues with any other any other equipment, it's just the cap stuff. And they use a smaller micron filter. So they're looking into that for me. What's yeah, that? they're trying to protect their fuel system. Yes, they are. Maybe it's not their problem, maybe it's ours. Maybe we need to up our filters on our end. Yeah, I, we're saving the filters. We're going to let them take the set of the filters and evaluate them. Um, we, we cut some open and looked at them. We don't really see any issues. We're not seeing anything that's out of the ordinary now. So we're going to let them do that. And then uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try some. Uh, in the past, we haven't been able to get um, filters from the local agencies that, that meet those numbers, that numbers would cross over, but now they do. So we're going to try some, some NAPA filters or some fleet guard filters and see if, if that improves what's going on. In fact, you're one. No. Um, also on the landfill where they're doing one to build out of one of the cells, that ran into a mud vein that runs through there. That's been a little bit of a challenge for, for the scrapers. They're working working through it. It is weird how the blood vein runs right through the middle of the stop still. And they're down they're down twelve feet on that side already and it's still there. You said that vein's pretty sandy, so it's probably alluvial. Any questions on length though? They are going to so those scrapers were on ramp and I told the the guy that I deal with that we were down with them for, and they're going to make adjustments for them for the rates on them. Did we get those scales moved and everything? Oh, yeah. He's doing it in phases. So, um, and we also have Wesco hauling in some <laughs> soil, too. So there's three different companies right now hauling with the potential of one to two more hauling. 
contaminated soils and stuff in. Um, the scraper, we do have, we're, they're working on getting a demo. Um, there's a newer scraper that's coming on the market. And they're possibly coming through here, so Dave's trying to get a demo set up to where they'll actually stop the landfill and do a demo for us. Not the scraper, the sorry, the shredder. Sorry, shredder. You have me confused. My, my, <laughs> you just told me, but yeah. All right, wrong word. <laughs> yeah, shredder, sorry. Um, so the weed and pest department is on schedule. Um, they've got two more gravel pits in Rangeley area. Um, and then they and then two in Meeker plus the old dump. Um, they've got a cathedral and marine towers bare grounded. Um, they're starting on the 22 tomorrow. Um, when they or today, I guess, actually. When they're done with that, they'll be done with the Rangeley area and moving on to Peons Creek and working their way up this way. Um, there is two pallets of cricket bank coming in this Thursday, um, and they've also delivered six cases of mosquito dumps to Rangeley. Um, and there's a sign up sheet for all those. So, are, are, we, are we just giving those mosquito things out? Are they paying for them? We're just giving them out. I think you're just, yeah, giving them out. just giving them out for, for this, just to see if it, if it does. You know, is is that the same thing that Murdoch's has? You know, I don't. Know. I didn't know Murdoch's had anything. Probably those they are do, I have it for my pond. Huh. But maybe you could have well, have her that's check that out and see if it's the same product. out um, water turned on everywhere um, they set up extra stalls and everything for the Mustang roundup that they did um, they also had rodeo Bible camp um, last week also the cornhole tournament and dinner and everything there that they got all that set up for um, Thursday they're doing a 30-day clinic um, Mustang clinic um, the rodeo started last week, or this week, last week, the 8th. So they're going to be doing their Thursday night rodeos. Um, they will not have one the week of the 4th or the week after the 4th, and they won't have one in the middle of fair this year. So um, they did get the gutters in on the grandstands and the covered stalls, um, and they also got the heater put in in the building. And everything's cleaned and ready to go for rent. And they're working on getting everything set up and ready to go for the fourth, too. Um, we'll be meeting with them. We finished Mag the 22nd, so we're planning on sending some guys over to help get whatever we need done, set up, and ready to go for the fourth. Thing. I think the fairgrounds needs to be top shape for the fourth. On that. No, you guys do a good job at Fairgrounds, and Eric does a good job in Rangeley. That's for the county facilities. We do pretty good. And we we did try. Um, we had that asphalt company in our pit in Rangeley, and they had a bunch of just cutting material. That's what we put around the outside of the fairgrounds there to try to make it solid. It seems to be holding up pretty good. Um, that is one of the places that I wanted to possibly try some earth mine on that is to go around that and see if we can solid it up more. Um, we are looking at doing some earth mine ourselves here in the next couple of weeks as soon as we're done with MAG. Um, we need to shoot 33 this year. We're going to just go in, reshoot what we have, and continue the rest of 33 with earth mine. Um, we did get a spray bar so we can do it ourselves. Um, Trying an experiment, see how it works. Um, we're going to shoot it on some of our roads where we pothole real bad to see if we can actually save it from potholing later. It, it'll basically be a bag enhancer, so it 
water obviously is what makes mag work. Um, so as long as your road's got enough moisture in it, the mag works, but too much moisture also takes the mag out. So basically what we'll do with this earth line is seal it. It'll keep the moisture in and excess of moisture from going into it. So. And then for equipment and our fleet, our Mr. Or keep it all going. <laughs> um, we've had a lot of motor grader issues. Um, we finally got them all back and running, so um, hopefully that continues. Um, structure staying pretty good. Um, still got a couple of things out. The, we never got the loader bucket for the landfill. The loader one delivered it was delayed. I still haven't heard back when that's available. The loader for the tractor we got in raised the got here yesterday. We got to get that put on. Um, <clears throat> today we're working on shredder. Scrapers. We have to buy some tires for scrapers. Our, our own scraper. We've got two scrapers and we've got one flat tire on. We're going to have to buy at least two tires and we're going to buy four because we're getting our old, 20 by 30 years old. And they're Anywhere from three to ten thousand dollars a piece, depending on so the county has two scrapers, yes, and they're using them at the dump also. Yeah, they just use it. For, they're single engine scrapers or old technology, they're yeah. early 70s, and uh, we just use it for moving dirt around from cover and what have you. Would, would they be able to help pay for part of those tires then since they're used out there? Hey. Oh, they do. Well, True. Well, they, they fleet charges. Fleet charges for the, oh, the okay. rates. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Back at the end of the rates. Um, Polaris, you got that in. What's that? The, oh, yeah, the Polaris came in yesterday for the Sheriff's Department. Who were supposed to test drive that? Um, it, it's something I'm ready for. He wasn't going to say anything. Stop all I actually had difficulty unloading it yesterday because it came with a box van. We don't have a loading dock anywhere in the county anymore on this end. So finally found a place to back into a bank up at the fairgrounds. And I went home and got my personal ramps and brought down and we pulled it off. And now my ramps are kind of U shaped. Oh, no. It weighs about 2,400 pounds. Turn them over. Turn them over. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's that's all we got out right now. So separate motor grade was ordered last March, and we still don't have an expected date. The most recent expected date is sometime in September. So um, for I know it's confusing on these updates because I got to give one here to main meeting too, I guess. But um, for engineering, our chip job started the seventh, so they're moving on the chip job on County Road Five. Um, they're making good progress on that. Our paving has been pushed back. Um, they're looking at coming in after the fork um, on the July fifth and doing the road milling. Um, for the start and for that bridge there at Avery, and then they'll come back in and we'll start paving and move forward with that. We will be doing the shouldering on that project because it came in where we need to do the shouldering, so we'll, we'll go back and do that. Um, we are still moving forward on County Road 4 Bridge, just waiting on stuff to come back to the state. Um, we're getting close to not being able to do it this year with the time constraints, but we'll see. Um, and Van's also been helping with that culvert up on 27. Um, because when it was originally put in, there was a deal with Divisional Wildlife where the culvert had to be so high above the creek so that fish couldn't come up and continue on up the stream. So he's been 
working with Dave on all that. And you guys know what happened yesterday, so that's kind of on a little bit of a hold this second. So, um, as far as road and bridge, we did finish all the mag in Rangeley. Um, we're basically done mag in with everything except for County Road 8 and 8A. Um, we will finish that up hopefully the 22nd of June will be done. Um, they are magging from trappers out to almost the county line today. And then, like I said, just moving forward with that, getting close, a lot closer to being done. Um, we've also had, still had some flood cleanups and stuff that we've had to do in Rangeley, um, 109 and 89. Um, we had Rangeley come up and help do some sinkholes. We had a bunch of sinkholes on 142. They just kept showing up everywhere. Um, Mr. Flinglesmith called them in and we went out and Stevie was fixing them and then the greater went into one that we didn't even know about. So we ended up spending quite a bit of time out there fixing sinkholes and hauling material and pulling material and everything. Um, we also had Rangeley come up and help with some track sealing up on County Road 8 before the paving. Um, I did. We get the radio discussion, so you guys have 38 minutes. Let's uh, let's bring back the radio discussion. So off line, me and Scott spoke. Um, he recommended uh, when we were talking about it, said four dual band radios would allow supervisors and lead individuals to have a dual band radio for communication, and then we could look at having. Uh, the remaining 80 as uh, strictly 800 megahertz radios and then do a uh, do new rather than permission higher than and then we could then uh, budget for programming and that way we can move forward on this. But Scott is he and I was I was thinking about that on our break what if you priced out what a BHF radio would be a standalone instead of doing the dual band and seeing the difference between a dual band versus a BHF and a DTR radio? And that way, because the communication piece, the more I thought about it, those supervisors, if they're on BHF, will miss a lot of traffic on the DTR side. Supervisors should have their truck unless they are out in a piece of fire equipment. They'll have their truck there where they can communicate back and forth. But I do agree with you. I just think from past experience, it was easier to have two radios than it was to have. Because if you have to relay a message and you're sitting there fumbling around trying to get back yeah. to wherever you need to be. Can can we can we do something so that we can we can move forward? Can we if we agree on the eight radios for the eight hundred and that would cover right now the six that are down and give us two and then we can then explore the uh, cost benefits of the other four being either dual band or strictly eight hundred in, in VHF. Then that way we can get we can get moving on the eight and and then we can just do some some rough figures of saying, you know, eight at at six thousand, that's twenty four thousand. Average programming costs with with Cody is what between three and five thousand dollars. But I don't know. I haven't looked at. I don't know. I'm thinking, you know, thirty six hundred at eight is twenty eight. So then, if you have another four, I mean, what if sixty? I think sixty gives you plenty of room to be able to. The other, price out. The other question I have is how um, see how we went away, we were going away from some of the truck ones. Um, they had a version to where you could actually put your handheld in it and it would charge and you could run everything through your handheld. You still have the typical mic in the truck and everything, but it was a base unit that went in the truck and would charge your radio and do everything. Um, and you didn't have to buy a separate radio for each piece of equipment. Um, I, I think 
get back with, with them and see how that's been working for them. It was something they were starting when I left. Um, but if we could do something like that on some vehicles and try it, it could potentially save you the truck expense. Back in Eagle County had those. But if I remember right, he had like a, a rack that he could put three different radios in. And I can't remember how it worked, but he could, that solved his VHF, DTR, and get some other frequency that he talked on. So. But it boosts the signal through the yep. vehicle still and everything. So supposedly it worked. And like I say, it was working when I left, but I would like to follow up with him on that. Could be at your radio expansion app. Mm -hmm. your radio yeah, maybe not an app because you're going to have to have extra batteries you want to use it that way. Just a pause. So maybe if we just came up with a dollar amount, a not to exceed dollar amount, okay. then you guys can figure it out. Just do the eight for right now, figure that out, and then look at the other, other ones and come back to you either in July or once we get some other quotes. And yeah, I think I think we're pretty capable if 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 the uh, we can internally do a, a quick review if if doing a handheld and, and that option of the truck is viable for the date and that would be a pretty easy sit down between the three of us to say no or yes it, it solves the problems and then and then we pull the trigger on the eight and then we can then come back and and I let you know on. On solutions we've explored for either dual band, strict VHF, handhelds, kind of what are those those other options? And then that way we get the six replaced, we have two on the shelf, and, and uh, we keep moving and we don't bring them. Do you get a discount for buying in bulk? I haven't seen anything on the radio system. Because that would be my only thing is. I think Anthony just ordered them, and I don't know if we got a discount or not. I, I, I mean, we could easily ask that, and then, you know, if that changes anything significantly, we could give, her, give the three of you a heads up. Say, hey, we, we really, should, this deal is awesome. We should we should go ahead and move on to 12. But if we don't, we get a negative on that. We can just assume, you guys can just assume, no news is we're purchasing eight, and we'll circle back with the option on additional four. I, I, I agree with, we just give you a, a dollar amount, and you do what's best for the 12. I think that'll be easier because then I can get it in this first supplemental and it can be done. And the, the definition yeah. of bulk is, is our definition is 10 and there's hundreds. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Worth a shot. I can help <laughs> with that. So, yes, how much are you guys comfortable with? What, what's that figure? There's you 30. Uh, 36, I think, is I think is brand new, um, and so eight at 36 would be 28, eight, and then depending on you know what you did with the other four plus programming. And so, maybe. Yeah, they can. Hopefully, that'll cover it. We'll make it work. Hmm? We'll make it work. So, 57.6 would be 16 radios if you went the option of dual band, four dual bands, or adding four more radios. I just figured, I think the VHF would be cheaper than the 800s. But your radio costs would be right under sixty thousand plus programming, so seventy. Do we get it done by? It was sixty. I think it's just wiggle room if we have to get a radio out for right now. I'm good with sixty. Are okay. you good with sixty? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'll pull it. She'll find it. I'll go back in the back and shake that money tree. <laughs> okay. So does that work for you guys? 
Eric? I hate that one. <laughs> are all of these road and bridge, or are they will they be anywhere else? Okay. Um, on Eric's update earlier, he was talking about the uh, subdivision out there. Um, it actually took me out and asked for my opinion on different places and different things to do out there as far as running lines. And um, we even talked, they're tearing up roads with this new spray bar. We might be able to come back and spray if it's been a mag road or anything like that. So. I think it's been a really good partnership where it opens up a lot of different things to where you just communicate more. Good. Unfortunately, I've had to work with Don some too. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> yeah. Just never like that. It's like being called in the principal office. It's getting almost too easy to work with Scott and Don and, uh, and Lee, you know. This, this organization, I think, has, has helped streamline some of the communication, allowed us to do a lot more, be able to adjust and move and utilize and maximize and make our original siloed and flat standard best for the It really has been. We, we had a meeting not too long ago. We were last week, and we yeah last week, and the three you know the three of us not at least with out and busy, but we talked about how this is working, how we felt about group. Of course, you know we're always hypercritical on ourselves, and then but as as a collective group, we felt that this is working well, helping us get some more stuff done. That I don't think we could have done before, and then you know I acquired Tanner from. From Scott's department, you know, and through those communications, you know, it was a hard feeling. Nice transition back and forth. And I think it helped us to allow opportunity, give opportunity to the, to the employee, and then also make sure that we hurting our other counterparts. But that was a poker game, and you won. He was not a one. <laughs> Got out of better hands. I didn't Part of knowing your people and just a good fit, and that was a good fit to help Eric out. So I think Tanner's going to be a great employee for us. I can tell you that the residents down there are real good. That's that's really good because that makes the whole county a better. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> And we did the same thing with Kirsten. Um, we were there early on the road and bridge, and she was just a great fit out the landfill. And she has been a rock star out there for Corey. I mean, she is awesome. I love to go to work every day. Oh, man. Attitude, great attitude, you know, hope. But yeah, she's, she is fun. Um, the other thing that we have been working on is we've been working on our reviews. Um, and I also want to let you know that. We did open up Ripple Creek yesterday, and uh, don't it's open all the way to Yampa. Um, Ripple Creek is open, but it is down to one lane and a spot where we have a slip. So we're going to monitor that. Um, we may have to close it back up. There's a, there's a slip and then a dip within a quarter of a mile or so. So we're monitoring it, but it is open so that people can come across. Um, and we do have it signed and everything. That up on almost on top where oh. it historically has been. Yeah, that's where we fixed it. On the other side. Yeah. Um, I also <laughs> have made contact with um, the only rock scaling company that I could get to call me back was GSI. Um, I can't get anyone else to call me back. And GSI was supposed to come up last week and meet with me on some rocks on eight. That one there at Green Cabins is a concern. And there's no way that I, I can see us getting up there safely to bring it down. Um, they just more than willing to shoot it, but um, we got to have someone to go up there and do, do stuff with it. So um, I am waiting to hear back on them. So if they come back with something that's 
pretty small thing we can figure out how to do it. Uh, we've looked at trying to cable it down and everything else, but it's really not a safe way to get up there and do it to where I don't, we aren't putting our people in jeopardy. Talk to the operations department, they got people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those where there's not a lot of safe areas to get in there. Yeah, it's just we just in ten right up there with it. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you buy a drone. I want to see that. Yeah. At least drone fly it up there. If I hear back from them, I'll give you an update on that. It is, we've had a lot of rocks come down there this year, and that one big one is, like I say, it is a concern. Oh, I am. Thanks. That's a good work. You got all sorts of time now. Well, all righty. We are done with our work sessions.